thanks everybody for coming. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. It's a, certainly the most exclusive and amazing venue that I've ever been at. Um, I have a, a very simple message actually, and the, the, the simple message is that we can learn from animals. And this is really not new. I mean, the, um, high cultures in, throughout humanity have done that. And I, I think we've just lost it a little bit in the last hundred years through the Industrial Revolution, and we can gain that knowledge back. It's actually really simple. Um, the miners did it with the canaries in the coal mine. And I think there's also a, a global threat now to the natural resources, as most of you know, all of you know, uh, we are a little bit careless about uh, what we're doing in the world. And I think asking animals how they perceive it and how they can help us uh, will be able to guide us. Uh, we do that in every day's life. Uh, we use our dogs to find things. Um, we use, or even the Romans in the old days, uh, used the geese to really tell them when the enemies are coming. So uh, these are really not new concepts. I think all we can do now is really that we do this on a global scale and we can link animals together. So that's the new thing, that um, through linking the behavior of animals together on a global scale and looking at these big data in real time, uh, we can really understand what life is all about and what, what they can tell us. And I think this is also understanding the sixth sense of animals. It's really uh, the, the phenomena that we can't understand but the animals apparently know it. Um, this is something that we can uh, start to understand now. Well, we call this the, the Internet of Wings um, or Internet of Animals. Uh, it's really the, the best that evolution has produced, these sort of big organisms that sense the environment. And all we need to do is um, ask them, how, how do you see the environment and what do you know about all the interactions? So it's a, it's a very simple thing. And uh, it, it's crazy that we haven't used that before, but in a way it's, it's natural because uh, so far we could only observe animals for a little bit uh, of their lifetime. Now we want to observe them their entire lifetime to really understand the ontogeny, the, the development of behaviors and movement, um, and also the survival, which helps the animals because we, we have the ethical commitment to help them because they give us information and we give them um, help to live their normal lives. Um, and I think that will also change our relationship to animals on a global scale. Now, we can already do that to some extent. Uh, these are tracks of animals um, that we have in MoveBank, this global database that we put together, um, where, we, at least on the terrestrial side, we sort of start to understand where animals move but it's, it's basically a gap analysis showing where we have done studies and um, not really where the animals are moving. What, what we're doing is putting little devices, electronic devices, on animals um, and usually make them smaller than actually in this case. This is a, a tropical bee that will fly with this device for a few days and then throw it off. That works fine. But you can also do it in butterflies. Uh, actually, it works fine, so they... They fly off nicely. They, this is a monarch butterfly that we tracked in an aviary first, but then also in the wild. Um, but the, the problem there is that um, obviously those kind of devices can only be read out locally. And that's a big issue because local tracking is fine. We learn something about an animal or a, or a small group of animals. But in principle, we want to learn about the collective, the global collective of animals. Uh, this can be done on the long term with a little solar panel on that, on that uh, tag. Uh, but we want to, as I said, learn about the global collective. So how do we do that? So far, the only way to do that is with cell phones. So this is a, a happy stork family. Everybody and the kids have their cell phones, so no, no fights about that. Um, but obviously there, there are, as we know, everybody knows, there are um, holes in the cell phone system in the deserts, in the, over the oceans, and so on. And obviously those units are also too large. Um, we want to have much smaller units because this is something, it's a huge component that we try to miniaturize these things and make them as wearables, basically, like we have watches or ear tags or, or, or bracelets or whatever that don't really disturb us. So this is still, it's, it's okay for the storks, but it's not 
quite okay for the small animals. That's why we have to really miniaturize these things. But most animals are small. These are um, uh, weaver birds in Africa. The, um, they, they are in, in huge flocks. And this is something that's happening also in, in Europe. I mean, birds come from their um, areas where they spend their non-breeding season and come back to our places to breed. And the problem is that we are losing a lot of those. So this is really uh, much of our uh, motivation. Uh, over the last 30 years, this is not our study, it was published a few years ago, uh, really showing that from these about um, 2.1 million birds, we've lost about 280 million. Uh, 2.1 billion, sorry, uh, in Europe. We lost about 280 million. And that's potentially a serious concern. Well, why is it a concern? There's actually one really good experiment that shows us what's happening if we lose our birds. And there was a deliberate uh, intention to get rid of the sparrows uh, during the time of Mao in China. So they tried to keep the birds up, to keep the sparrows up in the air until they die. And they were pretty successful, actually. They uh, killed about two billion sparrows. And uh, what happened, and, and that's why it's such an incredible experiment. Um, the, the years after that, they had um, horrible um, um, har uh, horribly bad harvests. Um, everything was destroyed by pest insects, and they had to re-import sparrows from uh, Russia to uh, ha have the sort of the natural control um, of the pests again. And I think that really shows us that what we are doing right now is maybe not as extreme, but it's not uh, too far away from what's happening there. Now, in many cases, we don't know yet what's happening to our animals. Uh, in the birds, for example, do they die? Are they caught, being caught in the mist nets that stretch 700, 800 kilometers in uh, northern Africa? Are they being trapped in the Mediterranean? What we want to do is really to um, show where animals need to live and where they have problems and where they die. And we want to do that on a global scale, so that's why we want to set up a system, experimental system on the space station. It's actually a project that Kasper Thorup and I uh, came up with. Kasper is here, he's uh, from Copenhagen, he's the head of the Danish bird banding scheme. Um, so we came up with this uh, sort of crazy idea a long time ago, 16 years ago, to say, well, let's just make a, a global system. It shouldn't be that difficult, right? And we thought it takes us about two years, but now we're uh, back here uh, 16 years later uh, with the same idea, but it's, it's almost happening. So the idea being that we need um, a system to look at small radio sources on the globe actually comes from this old guy uh, who just died last year, unfortunately, George, who constructed the very large array, a radio telescope in New Mexico to look at the skies and really map the, the radio sources in the universe. And he said, well, just do the same thing and map the radio sources on the ground, on, on Earth. Uh, why are you guys in ecology so stupid not to really get together as a global community and do the same that we radio astronomers have done for the universe? And uh, that's what we are trying to do right now. So experimentally, we have it, we have it on the ISS. We have tags, electronic tags on the animals. We have data centers and all that set up. Uh, the tags will be extremely small because we optimize the connection. Uh, we can tag a multitude of animals on a global scale. So that's the idea. Where are we? Well, we are at 3.5 grams. We wanted to be at 5, but now we are at 3.5. It's a GPS logger, um, acceleration, magnetometer, temperature, humidity, all kind of sensors that can be included. And that can go um, on animals to really ask them, well, where are you? How, how, how is the environment there? And what are you doing? The system in space needs to be large, because if you have a small tag on the ground, you need a big antenna in space. Um, this is what's uh, up on the space station now, waiting for a spacewalk on the 8th of August. It's pretty difficult electronics. That's why it took a long time. Um, it needs to be tested in all kinds of test facilities. Uh, it needs to be shaken uh, to simulate the conditions during the launch. Uh, the engineers have to be happy. Um, you have to, <laughs> you have to uh, train the cosmonauts. That was actually the main issue, because the Russian cosmo cosmonauts didn't have a, a water tank to train with. 
because the building company went bankrupt and they couldn't train for two years. So all these kind of small issues that you need to deal with. Then you need to get to the right rocket. So initially we thought we are on this December rocket, but it actually was good because that burned up in flight. So a little bit of a delay doesn't sound all that bad if you um, compare it to burning up. But it was actually really uh, interesting when we were in Baikonur. This is actually Casper standing here. Uh, Baikonur, and you see the, the rocket come out. This is a sort of an interballistic continental missile rocket, but remodeled for space flight. Uh, came out of the hangar, um, and our antenna is in here. And again, here's Casper. So this is uh, the, an empty, the empty launch site. The rocket went up, and that's a really good sign. It took <laughs> two, day, two days of waiting, uh, but it's, it's really impressive to see these things go up. And uh, now it's in the space station up here, the antenna. Uh, it's waiting for the deployment. And the nice thing is that this is really the first time that we can do Internet of Things via space. Uh, so it's a code division, multiple access system, a CDMA system that lets you read out many tags at the same time through a code. Um, what it does is basically a line scanner going over the globe, and as you uh, go over a tag or many tags, they send the data. And then you can really scan um, hundreds, millions of tags around the globe. Obviously, we need more payloads, more readout systems than just the uh, ISS. But experimentally, that's initially good. It, it uh, crisscrosses the globe, and you see every little line here. You can read out 100 tags within three seconds, repeatedly all over the globe. So a pretty powerful system. As I said, 8th of August, the spacewalk uh, is scheduled. So two cosmonauts go out for five hours and fix the antenna, unfold the wings, and then everything should work. The data set, uh, database is already set up. We have already data from 700 species in there, um, starting to prepare what we want to do in the future in these big data set systems. But now let me show you what is possible now, uh, and that's just based on cell phone systems, so in the large species. Let's go to the storks. Well, you think storks we know, right? Well, now we can really um, start to study storks in all of these areas where they breed, the green areas, and see how they really go into the uh, wintering areas. Go to Spain, to these beautiful old oak trees, or to Tunisia, or to Uzbekistan. I take a cherry picker and go up the, uh, the trees. You, you learn how these animals die, but you also, more importantly, learn everything they know. So you know, you see the world through the eyes of these individuals, because we tag them in the nest, and as they leave, we know everything they know. Basically, in every second or every few seconds, we know what they are doing. This, for example, was somebody who didn't make it, uh, fell in a, in a little pond. This one was flying with adults, um, powered it, uh, himself or herself out, and uh, was dying in this little Bedouin village. Another one uh, evaded a sandstorm in Algeria, um, showed up in this village here, and we didn't know what's happening here. But then there was this uh, young lady feeding it, uh, so rescuing it, feeding it with little fish out of the local pond. Um, others, this one uh, was one eaten by a leopard in sub-Saharan Africa. I uh, found a tag because it was in this village. Uh, or you have some that leave too late, uh, snow is coming in here in Armenia, um, or others are arrested, uh, some had uh, rings from Israel. <laughs> so, so this is... Uh, this has happened uh, a few times now, unfortunately, so... Oops. Uh, but we, what we can learn from the, the combination of these animals is really, uh, in this case, how they circle um, up in this um, trip from southwestern Germany into um, Spain and, and uh, continuing on into, Fran into uh, northern Africa. But you already see that the circling is not straight up, but it's sort of twisted. And that tells you about the winds. So you can learn through that about the winds in the atmosphere but not only about the winds, but also about the, the wind speed in different altitudes and also the thermal strength 
in different altitudes. So this is something that's, they are actually data that are really difficult to come by, and the storks as a group really show you um, how to measure them. Uh, you can also really map out each thermal, so you see the thermal down here going from low to high, and you see exactly the strength of the thermal in this part of the atmosphere. And those are very difficult data for the meteorologists, so we can actually help the, meteor or the birds help the meteorologists understand the atmosphere here. Uh, even more, what we find really exciting is, this is the first 10 minutes of these young storks flying together as a group on their way to Africa. And you see that some are goofing off, they are sort of going here, maybe they're just not as good. Some are really strong, the, the Schwarzenegger types. And, and what you see is that the, the, the ones that uh, goof off, they don't make it, they, they only make it to Spain, which can actually be a good thing, because if you make it to sub-Saharan Africa nowadays, you may be very strong, but you don't survive because there's lots of conflict down here and you're being shot. So the best, <laughs> the best way to actually survive is in Northern Africa right now. And this is very exciting because the first 10 minutes of a flight of these storks really tell us we can predict how far they go and how long they will survive. So uh, interesting that we can now sort of have ecology as a predictive science. Now another aspect that's exciting about tracking groups that we didn't even anticipate is that there are these places where they congregate as groups. You think, wow, what's, what's happening there? Well, those are the areas where the desert locusts have laid their eggs. And this is actually where FAO, um, Food and Agriculture Organization of the U UN, uh, wants to know where these fields are, because nobody knows. I mean, it's desert locusts. This is, they fly in the desert to hide. And the storks uh, know either through local sentinels or, or on their own by, by smelling uh, the locusts where to go. And now this gives us a, a predictability of where the next outbreaks are. This is important because still, globally, uh, one in 10 people are affected by desert locusts in areas that are now also known to be important for Europe. And this is where, if we ask our friends in, in uh, Sudan, for example, well, uh, no, just, you know, um, do, do you see these, these animals sometimes? And they say, oh yeah, we always see them when the grubs come off the ground, and, and that's when hundreds of storks are arriving in the desert. Now, in the future, we will also be able to um, miniaturize, I mean, miniaturize for a locust, uh, these tags, to really directly track the locusts, but that's going to take another three or four years. But um, at least the uh, governments or... Um, the politicians are becoming interested in these questions because they understand that this is something that's uh, relevant not only to sort of a, a crazy group of biologists, but that's a, a question relevant to society as well. Now, I mentioned that uh, miniaturizing is really important because then we can understand um, a, a larger set of animals. For example, eels. We still don't know where the eels go from Europe or from Japan or North Africa, uh, uh, North America. So this is something that uh, we can do and then pop up the tags to the surface, use them as environmental buoys in the ocean, track uh, salinity and temperature of the oceans uh, while sending all the data. Or you do this from a deep sea shark, for example, where you have 20 of those and uh, one year you pop up one, the next year the other and so on. So you learn about the life of these deep sea animals now. Uh, or there are thousands of uh, orangs sitting somewhere in captivity in little cages uh, waiting to be released. Uh, people don't want to release them because they can't... Um, they, 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 they want to know what these animals face in the wild. And so far, there's no means to do that uh, because there's no cell phone system, there's no way to track them. Well, we've developed a bunch of um, leg uh, anklets that uh, they can carry with them. Um, and tell everybody how they are. And if there are problems, then rangers can go there and help them. Now, having such a system, um, I think, is, is going way beyond science, but there's always really important new science there. But it's also really exciting that we can now really tap into the, what I call the sixth sense of animals, or people have called that, that phenomena where we don't understand yet how animals know about natural uh, systems, some, something like volcanic eruptions or, um, the, or earthquakes. 
Uh, we tested this at uh, Mount Etna in Sicily, went to the local farmers and said, well, you know, um, I wanted to track foxes or some like forest animal. But then the farmers said, um, or the herders said, well, I'll just take the goats, they're really sensitive. So we tracked them um, at Mount Etna. These are the, the GPS points of them running around. What's important is that if you take a group of these animals, so each line is a group of 10 animals for uh, one night from 7 to 3 in the morning or so, there's always some accumulation of, of activity. Always one goat active here or there. But then there are some nights where this is jumping up. And what happened there? Well, those were uh, seven nights in two years before volcanic eruptions. So apparently, somehow through the activity, they had some feeling that something's going to happen in the, in the volcano. And there's, we, we don't know yet how they do it. But apparently, they know that something's coming. Now, we wanted to test whether this is also true, because Aristotle told us about that, uh, Humboldt told us about that, about, volcanic, uh, about earthquakes. So we put tags aside um, and sort of waited for an earthquake to happen somewhere where we can get really quickly, uh, look at the aftershock, and see if animals det tell us something about the aftershock. Now, in this area, in uh, Norcia Fiso, a year and a half ago in Italy, uh, this was actually a, a situation where the aftershock or the, uh, was, was, there, was no, there were no aftershocks, but there was a new series of earthquakes starting with a magnitude 6.6 .6, um, downing the, the dome in Norcia. Uh, but we went there and had actually, just by chance, we, we had projected that somewhere up here should be the epicenter. Uh, this is the farm where we tagged the animals, and these are all the earthquakes in this area. There's a major one, but those were 4.7 and 5 point some. And we just tagged regular animals on, on this farm, cows, uh, everything the, the farmers brought, uh, chicken, the dogs, uh, the turkeys, the dogs, the rabbit. Uh, we couldn't take uh, repeated samples, actually, on the turkey and the rabbit because they were eaten during the holidays, but the rest, <laughs> <laughs> the rest, the rest of the animals we also tagged during the, the regular activities. And what we find is actually that the there's a clear um, activity that tells us um, th that something is coming, and this activity is about 18 hours ahead of the earthquake if, you are, if, you, if your earthquake is right there. So if the hypocenter is 5 kilometers over and 10 down, so it's really down there, then the animals tell you about 18 hours ahead of time that something's happening. If it's 30 kilometers away, so it's really far away, then uh, they tell you only about an hour or so ahead of time. And this is giving us a chance to now say, well, and this is a, a real system that we are going to test in Italy, but also in uh, southern Chile and Kamchatka and some other areas around the Rim of Fire in the Pacific, uh, right below, uh, right above the, the, the hypocenter, the animals should get some diffusion process from the the rupture from the future rupture zone, where you have this sort of plates sitting on top of each other and really creating uh, friction. If it's further away, uh, it takes a while to diffuse, so it's probably some um, processes that are transported in the air that's diffusing out from the, hypo from the future hypocenter. So this is something that we are testing right now, but the data are actually pretty solid so far. Uh, Disease transmission is another area where I think it's very important because zoonotic diseases is, is, uh, is pretty important in the future. Now, th those tags are still way too large to have them on for a long time. They, they were only on for a few days. But in these uh, flying foxes in Zambia here, uh, we could really test um, how they, as sentinels, can tell us uh, what they see about their environment. And they actually have antibodies for Ebola. They, do, they don't transmit Ebola, so they got a bad rap for uh, having these antibodies, but they're not transmitting it. But they, they fly out in the, in the landscape and sample the landscape. And if they have antibodies, they can tell us, oh, I, I flew out in this direction, and there uh, I encountered another animal that has Ebola, and is apparently the, the host of Ebola. So this is something that we can use in the future and find these diseases, or like in ducks, we can directly look at diseased animals 
For example, these stacks, uh, actually yesterday, uh, yesterday night, uh, we had three ducks, three mallards from our population, Lake Constance, fly into Poland in one flight. Um, so it's now the, the season that they move. Uh, it's really interesting because in, at Lake Constance they told us, oh, you know, you know, we feed these ducks at the, at the local pond and they're always there. And then we tell them, well, but I don't see them now. Oh, they, I don't, they're just around here. No, it's the time when the males uh, follow their females for about two or three weeks, go to St. Petersburg and come back. <laughs> and and, and they, they, they fly huge distances across uh, Eurasia in very short amount of time and can also um, transmit diseases during that time. Uh, we can measure their body temperature remotely and see that, for example, during this time, there's a study with uh, uh, friends in Sweden um, showing that even low pathogenic avian influenza can be detected by a change in body temperature. And this is something that we are uh, now also doing in, in China, um, in the Poyang Lake area that the FAO calls the perfect soup because you see that you know, the, the, the local ducks are interacting with the wild ducks, with the pigs, with the people very closely. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful area, but, but um, there are, there's potential for disease transmission because there are lots of disease agents. But what we can do now is really to understand where these animals fly and how they bring um, avian influenza beyond the, the other transportation routes through food or um, feeding lots. But you can also look at directly at these animals and see how they are transported from the local farm to the market um, with the farmers that are interested in that. Um, they, the transportation routes are a little difficult because you, <laughs> you have to track all these uh, sort of small scale transportation systems. Um, and then you, these animals end up at these, at these markets where you have strange interactions and zoonotic diseases um, emerge. Now, climate and weather is another one. Um, we wanted to do a study with our friends in, in Bhutan, just looking at the Himalaya griffins. It's actually really interesting. They are beautiful um, animals. And instead of just flying around in Bhutan, this little country here where we thought they would go, uh, they fly all the way to Mongolia. They, they go across the entire hemisphere here. Um, they crisscross the landscape, so we, you see every point is a GPS point that they produce, um, and at every point we can measure the atmosphere through their behavior or through systems that are um, on their little tags. Here, for example, they go over some of the highest peaks in the Himalayas. Um, they went up to seven and a half thousand meters, and you see exactly how they fly, and from that you can recreate the wind pattern. Um, you wonder how we can recreate the wind pattern, how we know. Well, we trained geese uh, to fly with these devices, and they even have a pitot tube here, so you measure the wind speed. It's really like a little Boeing or, or Airbus uh, measurement device. Uh, we, we train them to fly next to a glider, we measure the atmosphere through a sonic anemometer and many other systems, and that really calibrates what the animals see and what we see as a technical system. And then we analyze the hell out of it. But the, the key is that what you can do is really look at, uh, for example, uh, atmospheric turbulence, but temperature, humidity, and all these factors. And the birds measure it for us, either over the, the green, Greenland ice or in the high mountains in the Himalayas on 7,500 meters or 8,000 meters where the, the bar-headed geese are flying. So animals can really be environmental buoys for us. And the, the nice thing is that all of this gives animals a, a really high value, which means that, I mean, not that they don't have it anyways for us, but for others to show that, you know, this is a really ex uh, expensive envir uh, environmental buoy. Don't kill it, because otherwise you kill the weather forecast. Um, and this is non-trivial, because um, others have tracked um, um, bar-headed go uh, bar godwits, for example, from Alaska to New Zealand. They fly in areas where you can't really measure the atmosphere well, because you can't have drones there, you can't have low-flying planes there, but you want to verify what the atmosphere is, is doing, and the birds can do that for us. Or in the oceans, uh, these little turtles, 
Uh, you can track how the ocean currents work and, and measure the ocean currents through the, the movements of these animals, little, little turtles. But at the same time, obviously, um, make sure that the turtles survive because they are so important for us. I mean, for, for us anyways, but uh, for the others because they, they have a value now. Now, public awareness and citizen science uh, is a huge issue because all of those places where the animals go, we want observations on what they're doing, and we can't do it alone. So people can go out and observe these animals anywhere. I mean, this is Europe now, but this can be in Africa, it can be anywhere. Um, and you can do this through the Animal Tracker app. So there are probably only about three or 400 animals on there right now, but in the future will be a lot more. So you can go and see, well, what has my animal done in the last year? Uh, where is it now? And you can download um, offline maps and, and find this animal and make observations on site. Obviously, we have to be careful, don't want to disturb the animals, but still, it would be really nice to get these in informations on the, the surrounding of the animal, uh, the environment, and other species that are there. And it's actually then also very easy to recreate um, what the animal sees for people at home. So it's really your wild pet that you can follow and really understand um, what they're doing and, and where they have problems and where they need to survive. Now, the nice thing is that um, as a ESA, European Space Agency mission and German Air and Space mission, uh, Alexander Gerst is going up as a, a cosmonaut in June this year, uh, and he will take a, a little Blackbird uh, model with him, float it to the space, sta space station and talk to the kids in Europe and ask them to be guardians of the Earth. So um, guard animals and guard through the animals um, certain aspects of the globe. So um, this is the video that will go out. So he'll have this little, little Blackbird that we actually trained for three days to do exactly just this. So that's the closest I ever get to space, I think, <laughs> through, the, <laughs> through the little blackbird. Um, we, we drove it up to Cologne to film that and had to um, catch spiders in every um, gas station where we stopped. Because <laughs> the, the blackbird decided not to eat our regular food, but it wanted to have spiders and live insects. But any, anyway, so that's, that's going out to 30,000 schools in, in Germany, but also across Europe. Well, What's interesting about that is that the, the means that we have now to make these tags much smaller um, are enabling us to have animals like these little chicks here, um, when they grow up a little bit, to put these leg bands on as sort of what, what Casper um, and, and many others around the world are pioneering, really to um, have banding as a, uh, as a modern way of having electronic bands on animals to not even um, bother them with anything else but just a little leg band to tell exactly that information. And you see this little chick, for example, um, has now moved from Mongolia to almost Beijing, went in one beeline across uh, China over the Annapurna at 7,500 meters, uh, went to, Kazakh uh, to Pakistan on the coast, spent the winter there, to all the Stan countries and back to Mongolia. Now, the other ones, same species, demoiselle cranes, go from Russia through Baghdad, Mecca, to southern Sudan, and now they're on their way back. So if you want to see what they're doing, they're starting their, their return migration soon. So this is really exciting, and it's really um, also heartbreaking because you know, there are a lot of likes for this kind of thing, um, uh, because people are, are shooting these animals here. I mean, I, it's just tradition, I guess. Um, but it's nothing that we think should really continue in the future. Um, this is obviously a problem on a global scale. Uh, wildlife and forest crime is a huge issue. Uh, I mentioned this problem, where do our songbirds disappear? But our solution for that, or our help for a solution is that we want to really personalize this loss of 280 million songbirds. Well, 280 million, nobody has any clue how much that is, it's just a number. But if you lose Cecil the lion or, or Fritz the, the blackbird, 
it's a different thing. I mean, if, if the kids are really out there um, defending their own animals, their, their own pets, uh, it's a totally different issue. And that, that's what we want to do with this animal tracker app and also by really giving animals a name and, and a voice. Because this is what we get, uh, for example, in Syria. Uh, we get these animals back, or these pictures back, um, where some of those animals were attacked or banded. And uh, the note was, well, uh, we need peace and we need food. Totally understandable, um, but still, somehow, we need to preserve our animals as well. And this is uh, obviously a huge issue uh, in many places in Africa and around the world. So we are working at that, um, also having the tags small enough that people can't detect them easily, means that we can really tag these animals and uh, preserve them. Now, getting them smaller uh, is an issue. Uh, we need about three years to get them really small so that they can also be on these large animals but undetected, and we can help the rangers to really uh, guard these animals. Now, for us, the, the fun thing really then is that we can, in a way, fly with the animals, uh, like, um, uh, yeah, what was, what was envisioned for the, the wild geese. Um, in the wild geese, actually, it's a little tricky because <laughs> you, you get easily seasick if you fly with them. <laughs> but but in, the, in the raptors, it's much nicer. Well, we don't, we don't want high-definition videos from, from animals in the wild, but we, we want actually their view of a surrounding. For example, a stork, how do you see your desert insects, uh, your desert locusts, or uh, how many other animals are around that you take your decision with. So that's something that's very exciting for us. It's also coming, um, but it's still um, in, in very low resolution. So this is, this is high resolution, but not what we get usually. So the idea is to have, in a few years, really a, a totally new relationship between animals and humans. We want to learn from animals. They should tell us about life. This information is really, really important for us. It's so important for us that, um, um, it, well, it's actually the same kind of importance that we have for a guard dog or an avalanche dog or um, a rescue dog. We wouldn't ever kill that. Uh, we would guard it as well as we can. And that's the same we should do for animals globally because they should be, can be our sentinels, our uh, informants about life on Earth. And this is what we think the Internet of Animals should all be about. So thank you very much.